Hello, everyone. In this lecture, I will look at The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot, one of the greatest poems of the 20th century. Now, to understand this poem, you need to understand that in it, T.S. Eliot is fusing together two genres that were very popular in the Victorian age and the Romantic age. In the Victorian age, there was a kind of poem known as a dramatic monologue where the poem is written in the first person, in I, but the I is not the poet. The reason the poet is writing the poem is to explore another consciousness, to get away from himself and put himself in the mind of someone else. And the two great Victorian poets, Alfred Lord Tennyson and Robert Browning, perfected the dramatic monologue. And in one sense, this poem, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock is a dramatic monologue, but it's also something else. It is also a romantic crisis poem. In a romantic crisis poem, it's also in the first person, but the first person is clearly the poet. And in the poem, the poet is going through a crisis, usually an emotional, spiritual, or perceptual crisis. He feels cut off from the world. And by the end of the poem, he finds a resolution, a way to bring himself back in touch with nature, with himself, with his own desires. Now, this is also a crisis poem because although the I is not T.S. Eliot, it also is T.S. Eliot, the voice of the early modern period, a voice of isolation and fragmentation. The only difference is that whereas the Romantics found a resolution to their crisis, there is ultimately no resolution to the crisis that Eliot feels in the 20th century. Now, this poem starts with an epigraph from Dante, and it's an epigraph in Italian where one of the damned souls says to Dante, if I ever thought that you would get back to the upper world, I would never tell my story. Of course, Dante will get back, but the damned soul doesn't know that. But think about that. That's a weird way to begin a love song. Isn't a love song something you want other people to hear, particularly your beloved? But here is a love song that doesn't want to be heard or even overheard. It begins with a famous opening line as our speaker, Prufrock, who again is and is not Eliot, is about to take us on a journey through his world. It is an urban world, but it's a sort of dead urban world, a world of isolation and fragmentation where everyone is cut off from everyone else. He calls out to this woman to go on a date with him, quite literally, but this woman is cold and uncaring, and he invites her, but there is no love. This, this date is not going to bring him any closer to spiritual or emotional happiness or joy. And so the speaker says, let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. It's a strange way to begin a love poem or a date as if we're going to go through the motions like zombies, like we're etherized upon a table. But we follow him into this low urban world. If you've ever seen the disturbing movie Taxi Driver, think of the date he goes on and it'll make you think of this poem. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask what is it. Let us go and make our visit. So this is going to be a one-night stand, but there isn't even a real... Uh, excitement or, or, or even sexual intensity. Notice they're eating oysters, which is a famous aphrodisiac, as if he needs something artificial to bring him even to a state of erotic desire. We're going through the world of film noir, if you know old movies, a world of shadows and angles, a world where nothing is, is, is settled, nothing is steady, uh, th th there is no marriage. It's a world of hotels, cheap hotels, not a world of homes, but a world where everything is temporary. And this is the date he's inviting her to go on. And then suddenly, as we move to the next stanza, there's no connection. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. 
Later in the poem, he'll bring back this so it becomes what's called a refrain. It may even be like the chorus of a Greek tragedy, but here it increases the fragmentation because it doesn't really fit in the poem. It doesn't fit in the flow of mind. It's more uh, what we would call a stream of consciousness as the mind is fragmenting and moving from place to place. This is a world that lacks order and cohesion and harmony and balance. But there's something going on there as well. In the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. Who are these? These are the literati that live in Manhattan, the ones that are always dropping names from Michelangelo to Van Gogh to Shakespeare, but they don't really get any joy or even spiritual fulfillment out of this great art or great music. Uh, it, it is just, again, what we call dropping a name. Nothing is really for real. Nothing is truly intense. Then he goes on and gives a long description of the night fog as if it were a cat moving in and out. And then he comes out of it and says at line 24, and indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window pane. There's the cat again. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. And then the refrain comes back in the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. Throughout this poem, Prufrock keeps saying there will be time, but time is running out. He's a middle-aged man who has not found any joy in his life. He's stuck in probably some kind of low clerk job in the city. There's no hope. He keeps talking about art, but that art doesn't draw him into a deeper spiritual life. He says here, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. Why? Because in the city, Everyone wears a mask, not a mask like in a celebration or a Mardi Gras or something like that, but nobody shows their true feelings, terrified that they will be misunderstood or ignored or brushed off like a fly, as will happen to Prufrock later in this poem. He keeps saying there will be time, there will be time, but the time is running out. He lives a world of sort of meaningless tea parties. And those tea parties should be places to discuss literature and art and make you more happy and more joyous. But they've been drained of energy. They are just, as we say, going through the motions. He says there will be time for a hundred indecisions and a hundred visions and revisions. Notice how the beautiful word vision gets smudged, kind of crushed or sandwiched in between the word indecision and revision. This is a poet who wants to be visionary, but every time he seeks after a vision, it gets suffocated and crushed by the endless indecisions and revisions. A man who cannot make up his mind, like Hamlet, and in fact, he will mention Hamlet at the end of this poem. He cannot move forward. He says again, indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. Think of that last line. The word vision has been completely squelched and gone. There is no room for vision in this world that is not actively evil or even actively violent against him. It's just a world that's lost its meaning, that's lost its moorings. It's a world that has no touchstone, no truth that we can measure. And notice how touchstone is the same thing as proof rock. The touchstone is a stone that you can measure things against. His name is Prufrock, but he's lost that measure. His world has lost a measure of goodness, truth, and beauty that can give meaning to his life. And so he goes on. He's reached middle age with a bald spot in his hair, but everybody says, oh, how his hair is growing thin. It's a world where nobody says what they're thinking. 
Everything, again, is a mask. There is nothing sincere. This is the world of a Woody Allen movie set in Manhattan. It's really funny, but people have such a hard time being authentic and honest with each other or even authentic with themselves. Again, he keeps saying there's time. He wants to assert himself. He wants to make something out of his life, but it keeps being crushed. Notice my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. Sometimes the, the, the clerks in the city, the only way they can try to have some control is by being very fastidious. And some of them are very well dressed with a little bow tie with you know their beard, very extremely well groomed and whatnot. It's, it's a way to, to, to find control in a world that has no meaning, but, but it's not enough. He goes on, why is it not enough? For I have known them all already, known them all have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? I've known all the, the petty, endless cycle of things. So how can I presume to do anything heroic or, or even spiritual? There's nothing. Vision keeps getting squelched. I have measured out my life in coffee spoons. Again, we're thinking about the endless uh, breakfasts and the lunches where you're going through the motions. There is no joy. His life is just one ending round of meaningless, finally meaningless rituals. Not even the rituals in church that have meaning because the rituals in church point towards something higher, a touchstone. But there is no touchstone in this world. There is proof rock, but he is not his own touchstone. And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? He feels like fancy society has fixed him, like you take a bug and use a pin to fix it, a, a, say, say a, a butterfly. And that's the way he feels. He feels vivisected, cut open, analyzed by those x-ray eyes of society, but it's an uncaring society. And he can't move on. He can't presume the butt ends, the, the chain smoking. He wants to spit it out, but he can't do it. He can't move forward. And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight, downed with light brown hair. Underneath the meaningless ritual, maybe there is something almost uh, pagan, almost sensual waiting to break out, but it never does. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? If you've ever read any Virginia Woolf or... or, or uh, uh, many, of the, many of the writers, James Joyce, use what's called stream of consciousness, and sometimes it's based on synesthesia. If you've ever read The Sound and the Fury uh, by William Faulkner, where one of the speakers is an autistic boy and smells, everything makes his mind go back and forth. We're in a mind that can't settle, that can't fix itself. It keeps going off on tangents because it doesn't have the strength and the will and the vision to hold forward and make real its dreams and its desires. It just floats along. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl? And should I then presume? And how should I begin? How can I even begin to make a change in a world that has no moorings? And then another fragmented piece that stands alone, an image that I find so filled with sadness and pathos the voice says, shall I say I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of window panes? If you've ever been, say, to Manhattan or some big cities where they have those tenement buildings where you look out your window and the next building is maybe 10 feet away from you, if not six feet away from you, you're, 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 you're suffocating in the city. And we have this image of this young man, really middle-aged man, time is running out. There he is sitting in his window, looking out, yearning for something that's never going to happen. It makes me think of poor Willie Loman uh, in, in, in the famous play, The Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller, yearning, waiting for his ship to come in, but it never quite does. Just reaching and yearning. It makes me think of the, of the song Memories from Cats. And of course, Cats is based on poems written by T.S. Eliot. 
yearning that, that never quite arrives. Then another fragmented little motto, almost like a little refrain, a child song. Oh, I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. He almost wishes that he weren't human. Think of the famous or infamous short story, The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. Kafka, where this, you know, again, petty clerk wakes up one morning to find that he's been transformed into a giant beetle or cockroach, and yet his life goes on the same. Here we are stuck in this dead urban world. This is not the city of the Victorian age full of hope and promise and a Victorian spirit of progress. It's not the countryside of the romantics where they can get close of nature. We're in the city like the Victorians, but the city has lost its life and its vision and its desire. He goes on, uh, we're at line 75. And the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smooth by long fingers, Asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, And I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. There is ultimately a failure of will. But there's a great pathos here because he says he has wept and fasted, wept and fasted, wept and prayed. He's done all the things that a holy man, a monk or a prophet might do. But he's not a monk. No, he's not a prophet. No vision ever comes to him. He has suffered like John the Baptist. He has led a sort of ascetic life. And yet, despite that, his asceticism only leads to more emptiness. It is not led to vision. It has not drawn him closer to the good or the true or the beautiful. But you see, he has been ascetic, but he's not a prophet. He has had his cut, head cut off like John the Baptist, but he's not John the Baptist. Now, he hasn't literally had his head cut off, but he feels like his head's been cut off by that uncaring society, those fashionable ladies who look at him with their x-ray eyes and cut him to the quick and expose him for the, the weak, phony that he finally is. So again, he has done what John the Baptist did, and yet he's not John the Baptist. He has suffered but no vision has come out of it. Folks, should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? In one sense, that sounds like a fun life of endless tea parties, right? But it's an empty life, finally. It's a life that enervates you. In some ways, it enervates you more than if you were a farmer working with your arms and you know sweating and working hard in the, in the fields, and yet you come home and you can still feast on beautiful things. But this is something that may not be physically laborious, like a, like a, a laborer or a mechanic or something, and yet it is enervating because it saps us of our will, our joy, even our humanity, so that we end up like that pair of ragged cloths. He hears the eternal footman, that is a, a sort of metaphor, a symbol for death, waiting to take him away. And ain't the problem It's not just that he can't presume, he's afraid. Why is he afraid? He goes on and says, and would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worth what I want to do? Stand up and speak and assert myself and make a vision. Would it have been worth it after all? After the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me. And again, these daily rounds of meaningless rituals that don't bring people closer. The problem is not rituals. The rituals of the church do something. And later on, T.S. Eliot would become a sort of high church Anglican and be very much part of those rituals. But now these secular urban rituals don't seem to have meaning and don't bring him closer to God or even to himself. Would it have been worth it? Can I do anything in this daily round? Would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile? to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all, if one settling a pillow by her head should say, 
That is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. Let's say he could do it. Let's say he had the courage and the vision and the will and he stood up in one of those fancy parties and made his confession and spoke and called these people to a higher, richer life, a life of meaning. You know what would happen? Would they attack him and try to engage in a Socratic debate and show him that he's a fool? Would they even laugh at him and make a martyr out of him? No, that would be better if they did. What will happen instead is they will brush him off. Some fancy lady will lay back on her day bed and wrap her shawl around her and say, no, that's not what I was talking about. Did I, did I hear a fly buzz by my ear? You know, again, it, it's, it's better. Uh, one of my son, my son, Alex, went and spent a, a semester in Greece which is very much a post-Christian uh, country, like most of Europe, unfortunately. And I said to him, when you go there, your faith is not going to be attacked. If it was attacked, it'd be good. You could debate and go back and forth. But what will happen is it will be ignored. People there will think that Christianity is completely irrelevant. That's what's happened in post-Christian Europe. It's irrelevant. I would much rather somebody fight me so that it proves that these ideas are important and might have something to say about the world and man and God and all these things. But we're in a world, Prufrock is in a world that doesn't care about it. There's no sense of urgency. Now, when he says, I am Lazarus, that's really good poetry because there's two Lazaruses in the Bible. There's the Lazarus who died and was resurrected. And he wants to be like that Lazarus, but that's not going to happen. There's another Lazarus called the rich man and Lazarus. And Lazarus is a poor man and the rich man is rich and, and, and uh, um, avaricious and they both die. And the rich man goes to hell, but Lazarus goes to the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man says, oh, Abraham, send Lazarus back to my brothers to talk to them so he can warn them to avoid my manner of life and avoid this terrible place. And Abraham says, look, your brothers have the law and the prophets. If they don't believe that, they won't even believe if a man rises from the dead. So even if Prufrock got that courage, even if he became John the Baptist, became that prophet, nobody would care. They wouldn't even lock him up. They would just brush him off. And that's what's so difficult in this postmodern world in which we're living. He says it again, but it expands and would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more? It is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen. Would it have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning towards the window should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. That woman returns again, but it's just elaborated and extended as poor Prufrock runs the whole scenario in his head as people that lack the nerve often do. They keep playing it again and again, but they never do it. They're so afraid. They know everything that will go wrong. They're afraid that they will be just dismissed again. Not even laughed at, but just a a meaningless way, not even like laughing at you and making you a martyr. It would be good if he could be a martyr and have his head cut off and be like John the Baptist, but he won't. He will just be ignored. We are in an uncaring society and he feels exposed like he's in an x-ray machine or again, a, a, a bug with a pin stuck into him. Now, I just said a moment ago that he has lived the life of the prophet, prophet wept, uh, wept and fasted, wept and prayed, even at his head cut off, again, uh, uh, sort of psychically by the high society lady, but he's not John the Baptist. Well, I said that like Hamlet, he is extremely melancholy and over self-conscious and can't make up his mind and feels isolated uh, in, 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 the, in the castle of Elsinore. Look what he goes on to say. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. And yet he is. He's got all of that angst, those to be or not to be, all those uh, you know, uh, uh, indecisive soliloquies. He's got all of that side of Hamlet, but he's not Hamlet. In other words, he's not a prince. He's not royal. He says, no, I'm more like 
am an attendant Lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times, the fool. Now, if you know the play Hamlet, you will see that what he's basically saying is, I'd like to be Hamlet, and I've suffered like Hamlet, but I'm not him. I'm more like Polonius, the old windbag that advises the king uh, and betrays anybody, and even no problem betraying his own daughter, uh, always full of you know uh, uh, advice that has no real truth behind it. He wants to be a prince, but all he is is the fool, ultimately. And we're mixing Polonius together with the fool of King Lear, but at least the fool of King Lear, fool in King Lear, is actually full of real wisdom, whereas Polonius is a fool who doesn't really help. He's ultimately obtuse. He's the guy who says brevity is the soul of wit, and yet he goes on and on and on, contradicting himself in everything that he says. Most Americans, of course, think that the best thing Shakespeare ever said is, to thine own self be true. But of course, that's what Polonius says, and he's not really giving very good advice. He's an old windbag. Maybe Prufrock has been true to himself, but in a way that's preventing him from moving on and growing. Then another one of these fragmented phrases, I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Right? That almost sounds like a, like a nursery rhyme or something, like he's moving forward to old age, but he's also moving forward towards a kind of youth, a sort of youthful uh, senility in a way. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? Again, Complete indecision and something about the modern world paralyzes us. The paralysis of analysis is often called. Prufrock thinks and thinks and thinks, but he can't move on. He's trapped in his own brain. I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. One of the most hopeful things in this poem is also one of the saddest. Prufrock is not just a giant beetle like in Kafka's Metamorphosis. He actually is a man who has an imagination, who has real yearnings and desires, and he even has the ability to see those mermaids or perceive them in his mind's eye. He's heard the mermaids, and the mermaids represent the life that he doesn't have, the life of joy, the life of the imagination, the higher spiritual life. Now, if Prufrock was really a giant beetle, it would almost be better for him. If he really had no perception of what life could be like, then he could just struggle through the motions. But the fact is, he is a man capable of spiritual and aesthetic and emotional insight. He catches a glimpse of the mermaids, a vision of the life of the imagination. But he says, I do not think that they will sing to me. And then he goes on using Tercet's three-line uh, stanzas, which call up Dante's Divine Comedy. I have seen them, the mermaids, riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered, oh, I guess that girl's still there, we have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. He has a glimpse of the visionary life of the imagination, but he cannot join into it. And this world, at least Prufrock's world, cannot sustain this vision. And so this is a crisis poem that even has a glimpse, a counter vision of something that could draw him out of this world, but he cannot join into that vision. And so he's left 
even more stranded and empty than he was before. It might be better if he didn't have this imagination, but he knows just enough to understand his misery and yet not enough to get out of that misery and join the life of the imagination. And so this poem reminds me of poems from the Victorian and early modern period a romantic crisis poem that has no resolution. The great Matthew Arnold wrote a poem called Stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse, where he feels stranded. He wants to join the Victorian world of progress, but he's still a romantic and he can't get out of it. But he can't enjoy being a romantic, like Wordsworth and all, but he can't join it. And in this poem, we see him feeling cut off and isolated and, and a lack of any beauty or goodness. But at the end of that poem, Stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse, he has a vision, sort of like a vision at this poem, a vision of the Victorian march of progress as these people, they're, they're kind of like knights and ladies, and they're going forward in a great parade, marching forward to a life of meaning and purpose and hope to build the great utopian kingdom that the Victorians thought they were going to build. And yet, at the end of that poem, stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse, Arnold cannot join it. He is unable to be transplanted into that new world. And so he has to say to the, the people in the march, march on and leave me behind. I can't go. I'm, I'm too old. I'm too trapped in this world and I don't have the will to join you. Something similar also happens in a poem by Thomas Hardy, the famous novelist who also wrote poetry called The Darkling Thrush, written at the very end of the 19th century. He feels stranded like Arnold, like Eliot, stranded in a world without meaning. And yet near the end of the poem, he sees a thrush singing a song that's beautiful and seems to pierce through the darkness and meaningless of his life, very much like the Romantics, to a Skylark by Shelley, Ode to a Nightingale by Keats, and it seems like the bird will lift him to a new place. But at the end of the Pope, end of the poem, he gives up. He doesn't know why the bird sings, where it's getting its joy, and he doesn't even have the will to really find out. And that poem ends with the poet still stranded, unable to join in the joy of the bird. And finally, a third poem by William Butler Yeats called September 1913, where he's disgusted by the growing Irish middle class who are becoming, like the English, a nation of shopkeepers. And he's horrified by these people, the descendants of these great revolutionaries who gave all, not only for political freedom, but for a freedom of the imagination. And all that's happened is that Ireland has turned into a nation, a nation of shopkeepers, a bunch of Ebenezer Scrooges only counting their money. And it's a very depressing poem. But at the end, he said, wait a minute, what? If we could call back those revolutionaries, those people that fought and died for Ireland, romantic Ireland, he calls it, what if we could call them back? Maybe they would bring us back to a sense of ourself. And then at the very end of the poem, just like we've seen, he cannot join in the vision, or at least he feels his people can't join in the vision. He says, no, if that happened, everybody would go wild. They say, send those people back. They're, they're making us think things we don't want to think and feel things we don't want to feel. They're going to rile us up and stop us from building up our, our, you know, our 401k. Just leave us alone. And so we get a glimpse of the vision but we can't join in. That's what happens at the end of Prufrock. He has a vision, a verified vision that shows there is hope, but he lacks the will to join it. He has a crisis. He's found a potential resolution, but he cannot embrace the resolution. He stays trapped in his world, a world from which he's unable to escape and doesn't seem to have the will to escape. Now, when Eliot wrote this, he was you know, more or less an atheist. Later on, though, he actually became a Christian and wrote another poem that I would encourage you to read called The Journey of the Magi, which, like this poem, is a perfect fusion of a dramatic monologue. It's told from the voice of one of the magi that met the baby Jesus, but it's also a romantic crisis poem because it's also proof rock coming to faith. But at the end of that poem, there is hope. But in the world of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, there is not much hope. There is no love that can rise above the emptiness. And so he is left stranded in a dead world, glimpsing something, 
but unable to join in that vision. 